It really is a, an honour and a privilege to, to stand up here. And uh, I, I don't, I'm a full-time GP, um, and so uh, I'm busy. Uh, I don't get to do this very often. And, uh, and there's all the sort of things that, you know, when you don't do something very often, you sort of lots of emotions attached to that. But I've been doing it long enough to get over most of the, uh, most of the negative ones. So, so now I really look forward to coming and, uh, and talking and sharing some of what God's shown me. And it really is a privilege that you, uh, you listen. So thank you. It was uh, <laughs> quite, uh, quite an honor that you'd come along and, uh, and hear me today. So assuming that technology behaves itself, um, I, I am a, a, a GP, as I say, I'm a father of four. I'm actually a, also now a proud granddad of three. So uh, it's, it's quite a delight. So grandson number three is uh, four weeks old, 29 days, in fact. So um, it, it's just a, a delight to see. It's always a delight to see new people coming into the world, isn't it? Just sort of babies. I don't know if you like babies or just feel a bit nervous around babies, but babies just speak of, of new life and uh, potential and, and blessing. And it's, it's great to see. It's also quite a delight to see your children becoming parents. And, uh, and, and that really is just truly a delight. I'm very proud of all of my kids and uh, those who are, are becoming parents are a special, a special delight to me. It's a challenge though. It's uh, not always easy just uh, watching and learning and learning to... Uh, <laughs> you know, I might not do that, but it's not my baby. <laughs> so, you know, you have... A spe- Mind you, I've been thinking about this recently, you know. What would I think of me way back when? I, I want that time machine, actually. I want to go back, and I'd quite like to take some of you back and see how scary was that? They let me, with a new baby, out of the hospital, you know. <laughs> I was not that old. I did not really know what I was doing. And, and so, you know, when you've sort of achieved, you know, 54 last week, so, you know, had a few years of experience and four great kids and, you know, Phil says some very nice things and uh, just learned a lot from God in that process. But I started out as a young guy knowing absolutely nothing, trusting on the grace of God all the way and, uh, and that's a great place to be actually. So, yes, yeah, so to go back and see ourselves, you know, way back then, that would be actually quite instructive and uh, I think would take a lot of the uh, preciousness out of how grandparents think that they've not got everything. So, yeah, so lots of lessons to learn. But as well being a parent, it's really sort of given me a bit of an insight on how God deals with us. So, um, as I say, small babies are just so vulnerable and they just need all the love, protection, support and nurturing. And, and then as children grow, you don't keep them as babies, you allow them to toddle, you allow them more freedom. And then they get to that delightful teenager stage, um, that famous Mark Twain quote, when he was 14, he hated his dad, thought he was ignorant. By the time he was 21, he was amazed how much his dad had learnt in the last seven years. <laughs> you know, so teenagers are just a, you know, a special, special part of creation. I'm not quite sure what else to say there. Um, fortunately, all of mine are, are past that stage now, so uh, thank you all. We, we all survived, I think. Um, so, but there's a lot you can learn when you see that parenting to children role and viewing God through those eyes. Um, some of us, unfortunately, haven't had a good experience and we've had critical parents and we can end up viewing God as, you know, the, the stern old guy on the cloud with a thunderbolt ready to smite anyone who steps out of line. But that couldn't be further from the truth. So as I've watched my parenting doing my best, you know, with limited resources uh, and seeing how that works through and how much grace I need to apply to my children and how much I just delight in their attempts You know, so you see a toddler just learning their first steps. You don't tell them off, stupid boy, what do you mean you fell over again? You know, it's just a delight to see because you know that your children are going to grow, they're going to develop. God looks at us like that. He knows where we're going. He sees the end from the beginning. So so he views that. So I've loved watching um, my children grow and now my grandchildren grow and viewing God in that light. So today... You're getting the theme here. We're looking at parenting. It's not a parenting class, don't worry. Um, But we're looking at a father-son relationship from a story in Judges. And um, just going to learn a bit about how God parented a nation, but also how Gideon and his father Joash. um, So if you want a title, it's Joash and Gideon, a good father and a good son, is what I'm calling it. But how they did their respective things and how they managed their differences, but their togetherness. 
Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, I, I do like reading stories. The main way I study, I don't sort of get a passage and study in depth, getting out Greek lexicons or what have you. But I just like reading. And I go through various reading plans. Uh, and I was praying and asking God as I was coming up to this what, to, what would be good to, to share and to, to sort of bring out of all that God's shown me. And it really was this father-son theme. I thought, well, it'd really be nice to have something to hang that around. And just as I was going through my reading, I read this story in, in Gideon. And I've read through the Bible many times now, just over the, over the years, and it's the main way, as I say, that I study. Um, if you read in the thing again and again, you actually have to do something different. If you're just reading the same old, same old, it can be dull and dreary. And some of the patches, passages, even praying fervently, they still are a bit dull and dreary. So some of the parts of the Bible are not easy. But you can look and you can use your imagination. And one of the things that I've learned to do is, is various different things. Firstly, pray before you read. That's always good. Um, God shows a lot more if you pray before you read. But secondly, use your imagination. Just imagine you are one of those characters. And you can pick any character you like. You could be the main man. You can just be the hero of the hour. You could be the number two. You could be sort of, oh, would I do that? You know, you can be, in, you could be someone in the crowd. Sometimes you can actually, you know, just sort of make yourself think a bit more. How would you feel if you were the one who didn't get picked? So, you know, so and so and so, so picked by lot, and it went to someone else. How do you respond? So you can sort of put yourself in the picture. You can ask God, what does he think? And, uh, you know, look through all of that. And, and just you'd be surprised if you start to use your imagination as you read stories, how much God starts to speak to you, how it comes alive, but then how different things that you're needing through your life start to come alive. So we're going to look, as I say, Judges 6. Um, reading verses 1 to 31. I'm going to read them, um, and we're not having it up on there because I use the English Standard Version, um, and that's the new international version, both the Bible, but it can get a bit confusing, so I'll, I'll just read it from this, and you can use your imaginations and, uh, and listen as I do. So, Judges 6. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made dens that are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. For wherever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them, devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance in Israel. No sheep, no oxen, no donkeys. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would be like locusts in numbers. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So they laid waste the land as they came. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried to the Lord for help. And when the people cried to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you out of Egypt, brought you from the house of bondage, I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you, gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah. Terebinth is a tree, by the way. Um, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite. While his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, or please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened? Where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I've found favor in your eyes, please show me a sign that it's you who speak with me. Please don't depart until I come and bring out my present and set it before you. The angel said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went to the house, prepared a young goat, unleavened cakes for an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, the broth in a pot, and he brought them to the terebinth and presented them. And the angel said, take the meat and the cakes and put them on the rock. Pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the cakes. 
and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes, and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, and Gideon said, Alas, O Lord, for now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace, and today it still stands. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of the Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that's beside it. Build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with wood of the Asherah pole that you've cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day. He did it by night. We're nearly there. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of, altar of Baal had been broke down and the Asherah beside it was cut down. And the second bull was altered on the, offer, on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, who's done this thing? And they searched and inquired and they said, Gideon, son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die, for he's broken down the altar of Baal, cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he's God, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. So, quite a story, lots, uh, lots going on there, lots to, to read through. Um, but uh, I just wanted to give you the, sort of the, the whole picture, and what I'm going to do is just pick out some things as we go along through there. So... Just briefly, the judges is a cycle of stories, so the people go through the same thing. They turn away from God, they lose their protection, invaders come, life's miserable, they cry out, God in his mercy saves them by sending a deliverer or a judge, and they stick with God for a while until the judge dies. And they just had 40 years of peace because of Deborah and and Barak, um, the leaders who defeated the previous um, invader. And then they turn away from God, and and so the cycle repeats. And they get to verse 6, and they cry out to God for for help. And God's response is he sends a prophet. And so he talks to them, and he he tells them. Um, And he reminds them of how he released them from Egypt and from the slavery in Egypt. And implicit in that was the the warning that staying with God is how you keep your protection turning away from God, you lose that protection. Because it then says, but you did not obey my voice. And the Bible, so I've printed bits out here, but I don't know if your Bible has this. So there's up to verse 10, you did not obey my voice. And then you get this little sort of little subheading, little, the call of Gideon, and some Bibles just sort of break it up like that. And that can sort of add to this impression that that's the end of what God said, that is that what he sent his prophet to do, bad boys, I'm telling you off, I'm being really stern and angry with you. Um, What was the tone of voice that God said that in? Was he the judge on the cloud, as I said, with the lightning bolt ready to to smite? Um, Or was he really full of of pain and disappointment? I wanted so much more for you. This didn't need to be like that. And and our our picture of, of how God interacts with us can very much color how we interpret the Bible, and we've got to be careful in in how we do that, that if we think that God is an angry God, come to point out how badly we've done, then we're going to receive him in one way. Um, And so it's important that we do that, and so another thing that I always do is I start from the place that God is good. He's good all the time. If it's not good, it's not God. Devil bad, God good. Sort of, it's, it's, that, it's that complex. Um, and, and the other thing that I always do is start from the perspective that God loves me. And, and that is why Jesus came, because of his love for all of us. But when I'm on my own, that's, that, that's me. So, you know, it's interpreting from that, you know, from reading a passage and it conflicts with God is good and God's love for me, then there's something, there's something not quite right in my thinking. Um, there's a guy we're learning to love from, um, from Bethel Church in Reading, um, Steve Backland, who is, is great. Jan often quotes him um, with some of his declarations. And one of his phrases that he said is that if it's not glistening with hope, it's attached to a lie. There's a lie in there somewhere. So if you can't see something and have a feeling of hope, 
then there's a lie in there. And it's just spotting these things as, uh, as we read and as we listen, as we hear God. So if there's something not lining up with God being good and God loving me and hope being attached to it, then we've got to check out where are we coming from. So that's the sort of, you know, if that was the end of it, God just sent a prophet just to point out how bad they were, that would not be a good place to leave it. But the next verse is, he sent an angel. So the angel of the Lord came and spoke to Gideon. And and that's another way where you can spot whether this is God who's doing something. So if the, you know, the thought in your head just comes with condemnation and just leaves you feeling bad and down and, you know, nowhere to go, it's probably not God. In fact, it's very unlikely to be God. But if it does come and there's a hope attached to it, if there's a way out, if there's something that you can do that will bring a correction, then that is very likely to be God. But it's also important to see that God is a good God, he is a good father, because he didn't ignore the problem. And sometimes we can be very sentimental and we can say, oh, no, it doesn't matter. But no, God very clearly sent his prophet, said, guys, very clear, this is what we expected. And a good good dad doesn't shy away from the truth, doesn't shy away from there is a problem here, but it's just he doesn't leave it there, it doesn't come in with condemnation. So it's very important that that's, that's how he does speak to his children. So that was, that was God speaking to the nation, um, and then the angel is speaking to Gideon. And the next thing then we see, um, the angel of the Lord came and said to him, verse 12, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Love to hear that, wouldn't you? So uh, someone turns up and says that to you. But the first thing we can read from that is that when God speaks to us, the first thing He wants to do is remind us of our identity. He wants to remind us of who we are, and He starts from that basis. And when God talks about identity, He talks about the full identity, and He sees the end and the beginning, and He sees our potential. So just like us talking with a toddler, He doesn't just see you're making lots of mistakes at the moment, and that's how I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to deal with you out of all the potential that I see you growing into. And so God speaks to us from our identity. And often our identity, his identity of us is a lot better than our identity of ourselves. So Gideon's response was, you know, my clan's the smallest in uh, in Manasseh and I'm the weakest in the family. Um, So he obviously didn't have a high opinion of himself. Um, But it was important that God started with his opinion of him. Thanks, Teresa. Should be down here saying these things. <laughs> um, and the other thing I wanted to point out from that is um, he, he then went. Do you want to point that out then? I'm going backwards and forwards on my notes here, which is always dangerous. Um, no, I'll stick to this. Um, he reminds us of our identity, and then Gideon's response is great. He, he asks questions, and, and I often think that we feel bad about asking questions because is that somehow, you know, can you ask questions of God? Does that somehow say, well, God spoke and I've just got to tough up and do it? But he really wanted to understand. He asked in a great way, please, sir, my my translation says, others says it's please, my Lord. Um, But he wanted to know more and asking questions is not a bad thing. Asking questions is good. Seeking understanding, seeking out to find more behind what God has done. Um, But also what I, I really was impressed with you know, as I looked at this father-son perspective on this story, I, I was impressed by how much Gideon knew of God's dealings with his people that far. Our fathers have taught us, our fathers have recounted, our fathers told us about the Lord bringing us up from Egypt. Um, has the Lord forsaken us? He clearly had been taught very well as a young man. He clearly had, had a lot of heritage of Bible stories, of Bible understanding of the history that, of God's dealing with the people of Israel. And he was coming out of that, so that was there in him. So when this strange, bizarre situation, an angel starts to talk to you, what comes out of him is the good thing that had been put in in him as his youth. And the other thing that struck me just before we move on from there is where was he? Um, He said he was beating out, so this all happened while he was beating out wheat in a wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So this heavenly encounter, this angelic visitation, happened while he was at work. It was while in the midst of, it was not a promising situation. It wasn't, you know, there was lack, there was fear. He was, you know, the wine press, that that sort of pit. He wasn't doing it out in the open. He was trying to sort of minimize his exposure to the enemy. So it was an environment of fear um, and lack. And also, he was just there being a good lad about his father's business. He was there just working the farm. 
And so just sometimes when you don't know what God's, you know, what's God saying here, sometimes just doing what you should do, just keeping on regardless, just getting on there and doing the work. And it doesn't need to be, you know, three hours flat on your back with worship music going for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You can just be about your every day doing the thing that you've been asked to do. And in that situation, um, God definitely speaks to you. So he asks good questions, as I say. Fascinating. The angel doesn't actually answer them. So he didn't criticize him. He didn't tell him off. There's no no sense sense that he shouldn't have asked. Um, But he came and goes from his question, and and the angel immediately replies, I will be with you, and you will strike Midian as one man. And asking questions, we've got to give God that right. We've got to give fathers that right, if this is a father-son um, analogy, that you can ask good questions, and questions are good at ex- sort of exploring, looking for understanding, conveying your heart. Um, but sometimes um, you're not going to get an answer, and it's just sometimes the answer wouldn't be helpful, um, sometimes there isn't an answer. Um, but not every question can or should be answered. So he has this encounter, and there's there's lots in that story, and I'm just picking out bits um, as I go along. So so he gets there, and he does all the sacrifice and what have you, and the angel disappears, and suddenly this growing realization that perhaps this isn't a normal chap um, (laughs) has sort of finally dawned, and okay, you know, um, you've just vanished in front of me after setting fire to uh, the food that I've spent several hours preparing. Um, And so normal response in that situation was he was pretty frightened but again you know just lovely to see God spoke to him and God spoke peace to him so in verse 22 our Lord God now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face Um, and he was frightened but God said to him peace be to you do not fear you shall not die and that word of peace was great not just for that moment but for later on that night where God spoke again And God said, I want you to tear down the altar to Baal, chop down the Asherah pole, and sacrifice your dad's bull. Um, So he he clearly needed that word of peace to to sustain him through that. So skipping on to verse 27, Gideon took ten servants. Um, So it's interesting. So although he said he's the weakest in his father's house and not a great clan, um, he still had ten guys, at least ten guys, that he could call from. And clearly, he must have been used to commanding men because, you know, if he was just junior that everybody ignored, you know, 10 guys, what, middle of the night, you want us to go destroy, you know, the, the altar, you know, how many would follow that? But clearly, they were used to following him. And so, so I'm reading into that, that he was sharing with his father in the running of the business. He was used to commanding, and they were used to following. Um, and it's just another aspect of what we can see in that story from him. And it really speaks again of the father and son sharing authority, um, that he would let Gideon go and do stuff and expect him to do stuff, getting the men and resources that he needed to go with it. So he was used to being trusted to act on his own. But he was afraid of his family and the men of the town. Um, so I think we're skipping down. Yeah, so the rest of verse 27. He was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day. So he did it by night. It's okay to be frightened. It's okay to feel some fear. And we often think, well, if it's God, there should be just a sort of peace. And we can interpret peace as, as a lack of any negative emotion. Um, but that's not always the case. Feeling fear is not wrong. What's wrong is responding out of fear. So understanding that sometimes the thing God's asked us to do can cause us a little disquiet on the inside. We can be somewhat nervous, perhaps, um, of the outcome. But it's feeling that, but then making a choice. Um, And this is always, you know, choices is is such a huge thing. Um, We can all make choices, uh, and we can choose whether we partner with that fear and say, too scary, I'm not doing it, I need, you know, something else to convince me. Or we can choose to respond to what God's done. Because he didn't know, although, you know, I'm I'm sort of looking at the Bible stories and I'm looking at his dad releasing authority to him, and, and he didn't know how his dad and the rest of the family would react Um, He couldn't confidently, or could he confidently predict what would happen the next day. Um, So he did make a choice and chose not to base his actions on fear. 
But low verse 30, the men of the town did do what men of the town will often do, um, get a, a mob together and it often comes out with, uh, with negative. Um, and they decided that this problem needs judgment and punishment. And that's often the response that many have when they, when they see a problem. We've got to find a culprit, we've got to make an example of them, we've got to string them up, you know, obviously in that culture, killing him for destroying a, a, an altar um, was the appropriate thing to do. And they wanted to apply punishment. Um, and, and often when people come to a negative situation, something unexpected, they want to apply punishment. But my contention is, is that God's way. So the men of the town came um, and demanded, bring out your son that he may die. But then perhaps the best verse for me in all of this was uh, verse 31. Um, so we see, how does Joash's dad, Joash, Gideon's dad, respond? Because um, at, up until this point, the story, you've got to use your imagination and you've got to be careful when you use your imagination that it is just filling in. It's not what you base everything on. So when I'm talking about the imagination, it's useful to bring understanding and it's a fertile ground that God speaks into. Don't go too far assuming that what you've just imagined is actually gospel truth. Um, so uh, I thought I'd better have that little rider there. Um, <laughs> So, uh, oh, I imagined it, I imagined it. No, that wasn't what I meant. Um, so we don't know how much Joash knew up until that point. We don't know what, um, what had happened. But we do know several things. So the men of the town heard that it was Gideon, and they came to Joash's door. So that means Gideon must have been back home. So Gideon had enough of a relationship with his dad that he was prepared to go in, you know, confess all to dad. There's going to be a mob coming this way because I've just done this, you know. You know that bull, seven years, you've been feeding it up, expecting it, you know. Um, so he brought trouble to his dad's door. He had an angry mob coming towards his dad's door. One of the two bulls, you know, was, was now dead and sacrificed. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of fear and anxiety around. And then we read this, and I'll read out verse 31. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal? Will you save him? Whoever contends for him will be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because it's his altar that's been broken down. And I just love that response. And so what really grabbed me about this story was seeing a father's heart coming out there. He was confronted by his son who'd done something he probably would not have done. He was confronted by a son who's acted on his own without, you know, without permission. We don't know that, you know quite how he did that um, but he took that response of standing in front the verse starts out when the men of the town Joash against all who come against him he said he might be my boy but if you're coming you're coming against me and he took that father's role then of protecting and, and saying you know if there's something to sort out you sort it out with me and just that lovely picture of a father who protects even though he probably would have been confused upset wasn't what he planned, it wasn't part of his, you know, we don't know that it was anything that he would have sanctioned. Um, so, <laughs> there's a little distraction to the side, thanks Teresa. Um, so, I, I'm just in the midst of that, it's, it's great, keep going. Um, just in the midst of that, you know, I just wanted to pick out that sometimes it's about influence, sometimes we think that we don't actually influence the family. Clearly, that was a pretty significant influence on the family, you know, he's brought a lot of trouble to the door. But we can think that we don't influence the family and every part, every member of the family. You could be that new baby, screaming all night, nobody's sleeping. You could be the toddler that's, you know, throwing your toys around everywhere. You could be the grumpy teenager who's just sort of creating havoc wherever. You know, you can have all the negative ways in which you can influence a family. You could be just the, the helpful son or daughter who's just so willing to do the washing up or, or what have you. And in the church family as well, all the ways in which we can influence positively or negatively. You may think that you're just coming, sitting quietly at the back and then disappearing is not having an influence. It is having an influence because you're not bringing your strength. It is having an influence because why are they quiet? So other people will see and watch and, and they'll start to, you know, it, it affects other people. So to think that we don't influence the family is, is really not right. Um, we all influence. And so we, we have to make a choice as to how we're going to choose to influence. Is it going to be negative, screaming and complaining or just moaning and grumbling when we don't like what's going on? Or is it looking to Father and saying, what can I bring? How can I contribute? What's my part to play in doing this? Um, so however 
um, Gideon influenced the family. Joash made a choice, and he chose not to operate out of the fear that was coming towards him, these angry villagers, townspeople who wanted punishment and, and death. Um, he chose not to operate that, but to operate out of, out of love. And, and again, just emphasizing this about choices, that whatever we're confronted with, we always have a choice. You know, it might not be what you expected. It might not be what you'd planned. As, as a parent of parents now, my, my daughters and sons, they make choices about their lives now that may be what I'd choose, may not be what I'd choose. But, you know, how do I respond when the unexpected happens? And I have a choice every time because it was their decision, but it's influenced me. But I have a choice whether I come as critical, as, as condemning, as, you know, just putting them down, or whether I choose to believe the best and nurture and support and, and upbuild. And so all of these times, so we always have choices. And, and Joash chose to respond out of love and, uh, and not to take offense, not to use distance as a tool. Woohoo! There you go, Gideon, there's the townspeople. You know, you made a decision. Suffer the consequences of your decision. That's actually a reasonable thing to say. You should have a consequence to your choices. Um, but he chose not to abandon his son and leave him to, uh, leave him to the townspeople. He chose to stood in front of him and alongside him. And and I always sort of, as I was sort of thinking about this and imagining myself as that dad, which is what I did, um, and my sons killed the bull, you know, pulled down the altar. Okay, (laughs) what are we going to do here? Um, But I just sort of imagine what would it be? How was that father-son relationship? Um, And and I just had this sneaky thought, really, that perhaps, perhaps Joash, as he's telling these stories of God's dealing with the people, and he was looking at the Midianites and the Amalekites and everyone else who's marauding across the land there. And I did wonder how much of what happened to Gideon was birthed out of his father's dreams. And how much had that father been hoping and, and looking for God and God, where is your salvation coming from? We've heard of your glory in the past. Where now is the God of Elijah? And all of these stories that you can have that say, we know you do amazing things and we've seen amazing things in other places. Even amongst us here, some people seem to have amazing things happen to them. You know, what about me? And you can have that nurturing and reminding yourself. And that's why testimonies can be so good at reminding yourself of the good things rather than concentrating, "Mm, it never happens to me. Um, And and you can look for that. And I just have this um, impression that Joash responded well because what Gideon did was birthed out of his father's dreams. And so as he came to do that, as he had the unexpected, it actually wasn't that unexpected. And he was able to respond well because it lined up. And again, just thinking about how we respond, you can choose the negative or you can choose to spot the God in something and say, this might not be how I'd have planned it. If I was going to do things, I probably wouldn't have done it that way. But I do see God in it and I've got to overcome my limitations and make a choice to line up with what God is doing in a situation. So um, just great to see that, that heart of the Father there. And just as we perhaps think and, and use our imagination, there's some great verses. I don't know if you can get Psalm 32 up there, verses 8 and 9. Um, and I'll just leave them up there to have a look. But these two verses, um, the psalmist is saying, don't be like the mule or the donkey that needs to be guided by the bit, the bits, metal bit between your, you know, your cheeks there, that which causes pain, and you're guided by trying to avoid pain. Um, or um, being guided by the eye and being close enough to the Father, being close enough to the heartbeat that you can actually see someone's eyes, as Matthew was saying and and Jan was saying this morning, looking into Father's face and having that glimpse and seeing how God really does. Don't worry, John. Um, It's okay. Um, Just looking into Father's face and seeing that glimpse and having that connection and being close enough to see, being close enough to feel what Father feels and, and hear what his hopes and dreams are. And just that that sense that that is really what God wants from us, from our relationship with him, but also how our relationships with one another are, that we do get close enough, that we can look one another in the eye, that we can sort of be vulnerable and and open and share what our hopes and dreams are without feeling criticized or or condemned. And uh, and, just really that's what, what I'm hoping for all of us in our relationships. And so that really helps them when you've got a heart connection if someone does something that's not expected, you know, you can then choose to trust, well, I know their heart, so I don't understand the actions, but I know the heart, and understanding can follow, I can get close again. Whereas if you don't have that heart connection, someone does something, 
they are weird. I'll just sort of uh, take a few steps back here. Um, so Joash and Gideon, um, just what I'm reading into this story and what I'm pulling out and what I really feel God has for us is a, a father-son relationship that even though he was the youngest in the family, he was out in the wine press threshing, that nonetheless there'd been that heritage and history of how he's grown up in the family, that he was able to take authority. Um, he was probably acting in line with his father's, um, his father's dreams and wishes and hopes and that his dad's response acting as a, a protector before accusers is such a great picture of, uh, of what a good father should do. But what impressed me even more about Joash is he didn't just protect his son. He was standing for God. He said, will you contend for Baal? What a great guy. He just had that perspective that if Baal is a god, he can do what any god will do. He will create earthquakes and, you know, He'll do what you know, the God of the Israelites did and, and send in marauding armies. Um, so if he's a God, and so he really stood for the God, true God, against the, the, the Baal, the imposter, and he reminded the people, you are God's people. And so he's standing up there in the truth of that and reminding people of their identity that you know, if you're going to line up with foreign gods, there will be death, but you can choose to line up with the living God. And so, what a great guy. So I'm just going to pull, pull a few things out as we finish this. Firstly, I've mentioned about identity, that we are significant, that all of us have a something. And if you don't believe that, then that's a lie. And whether you just need to spend time with God, whether you get along good, good people around you, just ask God to speak to you as you read through the Bible. But hear how Father thinks about you. You are significant. You do have an influence. And, and you can start by recognizing that in yourself. Um, and then bringing your influence and your exertion, exert your you know, positive influence uh, around you. Um, the other thing that I like in this is that we always have choices, and uh, there are lots of choices, lots of opportunities there where you could choose to partner with fear or choose to partner with love. And there's a verse that I, I love and I remind myself and strengthen myself in quite regularly, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. And it's talking about temptation, but there's a principle there about how God helps us. It says, No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. So when something comes against us, and this verse is talking about temptation, but my contention is it's, it's a principle that's true. When something comes against us, we can choose then. Do we partner with a temptation that is a, you know, a really, you know, I would just love to do that thing. But with that temptation, there is also a way out that we can look and we can ask God, what have you provided for me? And it's not just, you know, I know I need to do the right thing. Um, that verse there very clearly says, God gives, us the, God gives us the strength to endure it. He helps us through in that process of doing the right thing, so doing what he wants us to do. And, and so we do have choices, and if we ask God, he'll always speak, and he'll always provide a means. He'll help you to, to do the right thing. Talked about influence and, and influencing one another, and just being that those who choose to have a positive influence wherever you are, and, and not see yourself as a little someone who can sort of slip in and slip out. The, the body of Christ is missing so much if you do that. A big part of what I like about this in the father-son context is obedience, and uh, Gideon chose, as I said, he was working the farm and, and he was just doing what he'd been asked to do. And I was thinking about that and remembering Jesus told a story of two sons and their dad asked them to do something. And the first son said no, but then thought better of it and went and did it. And the second son said yes, but then didn't. And Jesus asks, which of those two did the will of the father? Um, and so clearly obedience is not what you say, it is what you do. I mentioned about fear, feelings... Feelings are real, and you know, to deny your feelings, ah, la, 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 you know, don't feel that, don't feel that, you're not going to get very far. Um, it will trip you up. Feelings only become dangerous if we base our decisions solely on our feelings. And so we can make good choices even if something seems frightening. Picking out again, just questions are often helpful as long as you come with a good attitude. You know, you can pick holes in someone by your questions, by constantly, yeah, what about, what about, what about? And if you come with a negative attitude, a question is no longer a good thing. So make sure you come with, uh, with a good attitude when you're asking. Um, and the last bit about obedience is, uh, I've read this far in the chapter, it goes on, 
but we've not mentioned the fleece. Everybody knows about Gideon and the fleece, and we've got this far, and there's no mention of the fleece. As I was sort of preparing this, I, I sort of was thinking about the fleece bit, but it doesn't come. He doesn't have the fleece before he pulls down the altar. He learnt obedience just by what God had spoken in the night. And so sometimes we can think of Gideon, we can think of a fleece, and you know, Gideon's not criticized for doing that later when he was going to lead a few people to kill or to attack a whole army. Clearly, that was a sort of reasonable proposition to say, can you give me a bit of encouragement here? Um, but, you know, his, he first learned obedience. He learned obedience on the farm, and he learned obedience when God spoke. And it's important that we see this in that, in that context, that we can always respond um, and, and always have a choice to respond well out of obedience. Um, so when God spoke about destroying the temple, um, the, the Baal altar, he did it that same night. And the last thing has sort of been... You know, mentioned this all along, um, is about one anothering. That as we're looking at fathers and sons and looking at that context, um, you don't need to actually have kids to be a, a father or a mother. Um, you can give the good that God's shown you at whatever stage in life you are. And this really is my urge to all of us: is that we see ourselves as significant. We recognise what God has done in us, and then we look for opportunities in those around to say, "What can I sow into? How can I encourage someone?" How can I see them with God's eyes and, and look out and really say, I want to encourage you. What you did, you did really well. Or you seem a bit nervous. Is there any way I can, can help you? And we can bring our strength and, and look out for the best in those. And also when, when people mess up, when things don't go, you know, what do you do? Is it sort of, hoo -hoo, let's step back um, and, and just sort of use, use distance to protect yourself. But when kids make a mess in the house, you know, if everyone steps back, you know, <laughs> the mess is still there. You know, someone's got to clean it up. So what you do is you get your kids, so come on, let's clean this up together. And, uh, and so good parents don't ignore things. So as I said at the beginning, God didn't ignore there is a problem here. But we can be those who, when a mess happens, we don't ignore it, but we step alongside. How can I help you? How can I encourage you? It wasn't great, but don't give up. You can do better in the future. Um, and the other thing about just having that attitude is Paul, so many times in, the, in his letters, talked about imitate me. And you may not think you've got a lot to give, but you've learned something in God. And, and so Paul said several places, I've picked out 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, there's 2 Thessalonians 3 verses 7 and 9, um, about imitate me, as Paul says. And even um, imitating leaders, Hebrews 13.7 says, uh, imitate leaders and their faith. And, and so we can look for those who we can get alongside, look for those who we can choose to, you know, watch their lifestyle, pick out the good bits, and, uh, and imitate, imitate those, um, ask good questions from people. There are some people that really, you know, you should listen up when they speak. And, and can I just sort of say at this point, some of our older people, and, you know, you can include me in that if you want, but uh, I, I've no problem speaking and talking, but some of our older people don't always feel that they have a platform, and that sort of generation gap can be quite intimidating. And, and so if you're 30 years older than a young adult, you know, that's one thing. If you're 50 years older than a young adult, you know, what do you have that's still relevant? You have a huge amount to give. But what about young people, if I can encourage you, go and find some of these people who've walked with the Lord for a long, long time. Just talk to them about your life. Find out about their life. Hear their stories. Get close to them. And we can learn a lot just by doing a lot more to work across the generations and to have that attitude that I can learn from anyone. And it doesn't mean when you when you're talking about fathers and sons, you're not making someone your dad. You're not saying, I want, you know, I've had this in the past where, you know, young guys have wanted a, you know, a real, I'm just too busy, I can't do that. But you can pick some good out and we can have some time together. And so you can see this opportunity in our one anothering that you can have connections and moments where you draw. But it doesn't mean to say, you know, that's a lifetime commitment that you can draw from many different people and seeing what skills others have got and, and using that and just having that. And, and lastly, just in this thought about one anothering, it doesn't just happen by hanging around. You've got to be intentional. You've got to look for opportunities. You've got to make a choice and, uh, and decide that that's what you're going to do. Okay, so that's all I want to say there. So that's not an obvious place in which to, to pray, but we, we always like just to, to sort of pray and ask God to, to seal something in us. So is it okay if I pray for you? Father God, we, like, we love the fact that you are our Father. We love the fact that you call us your children. God, and just 
thinking of ourselves as a small kid cuddled up on your knee, that is such a comforting place to be, such a, a place of knowing your delights, knowing your nurturing, knowing your provision. And God, I just ask that if there have been any who have a negative parental experience that makes it a difficult picture to have, God, that you would give dreams, that you would speak very clearly, that you would open up imagination and that you would start to reveal yourself more and more and more as a good dad, that you'd reveal yourself as a father who loves. And so as we read stories in the Bible, as we hear of your encounters, God, the thing that grows in us is God is good. God loves me. And Father, would you do that for us? Would you have this deep, deep, deep within us so whatever circumstance comes our way, we've learned how to train our thinking. We've learned how to adjust our imagination to say our first response is God is good. Whatever's happened, I still know that God is good and God loves me. And Father, just ask for anyone here, God, if there's anything that's preventing that, that you'd, Holy Spirit, you'd reveal that lie and that that would be demolished and brought to any stronghold against Jesus will be brought down. Amen. Father God, just bring your peace and bring your blessing. And God, again, for those people in Paris and those families who've lost loved ones and those people who know of someone who's been murdered, God, we just ask for your peace. Would you prove yourself to be the God we know you to be, the God of love, who has already won the victory, who have already triumphed over evil. We don't yet see the full outworking of that yet, God, but we want the lie that the enemy is on the up to be brought down and the truth that you are an amazingly good God and you want to do good to your people. God, and for everyone affected by that atrocity, God, will you just pour in peace? Will you come alongside? Holy Spirit, will you be the comforter that Jesus sent you to be. Thank you, God. Amen.